Francisco, if you can join, I see that you join. If you can hop on to the live. Peace and blessings. Let's see. I'm gonna invite you one more time. Let's see if it works. All right, we're just waiting for our guests to hop on. Peace and blessings, family. Uh-oh. Let me see. I'm going to try to invite him one more time. Well, I comes along. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for being patient with us. There we go. There it is, Francisco. Yay. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Peace and blessings, family, and welcome back to our podcast, Unveiling Love Stories of Community and Social Change. Uh, this is a space where we invite Oakland leaders and artists to discuss their defining moments that shape their efforts in cultivating community, solidarity, and safety. This podcast is part of a Love Over Fear Oakland campaign organized by our family at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, Defending Humanity of Immigrants and Rights of the Incarcerated, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, uh, works at the intersection of faith, spirituality, and social movements. So this Love Over Fear Oakland campaign is a response to the challenges faced by communities of color in Oakland. They acknowledge the root causes that disrupt safety and community collaborations. So through this podcast, through photo series, we're gonna have an art gallery, panel discussion and community concerts. Artists like myself and Francisco was brought on to create dialogue and nurture connections amongst the AAPI Black and Chicano community. So I am so excited for today's guest, who's a fellow cultural strategist on this campaign and his amazing, <laughs> amazing work he's going to share with us. You know, in our last podcast, Kev Choi's amazing artist said it's so important to invest in artists. Francisco is a singer, songwriter, cultural worker, a theo theologian, pardon, and his music and work exposes the grace and beauty of immigrant community and his passion for social justice. Please welcome Francisco Herrera. How are you feeling? Salam alaikum, Amina. Oh, alaikum as salam. I'm feeling very happy to be here. Very excited about the IG Live podcast you've been doing. Um, so happy. I just, as you were doing the intro, I saw Irineo Mojica, wonderful, wonderful leader of us, jump on there. So mm -hmm. greetings to him and all the folks who are jumping onto the to the podcast. Oh, it's and it's an honor to have you. You know, one of my favorite things about being part of projects like this is learning about the people I get to work with. It's an honor to work with you. You know, I've learned so much from you already. And I remember you reminded me about something really, really important about the struggles and even the violence that goes on overseas and how that is reflected in our own communities. Um, and that's a great reminder for me because doing this work, I always talk to my dad. My dad and I will have hours and hours of conversation because he was an artist during the Cultural Revolution in China. And so I always get some of his guidance, his point of view on what is going on in our community and here, here in the States. So I would love to learn more about your work in Central America. Mexico. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and your work there. Well, all, first of all, all my respects to you, Amina, and to your father who played that important role during that very crucial period in China's history. Uh, great fan of the Chinese efforts uh, of liberation and a, student, and a student of that revolutionary process myself. So mm -hmm. Very happy to, to know that detail and honor and respect to your parents. 
Thankfully. Um, I'm from the border of, of Imper Imperial Valley and the Mexicali Valley, California and Baja California. In fact, my town is called Cal for California, Exico for Mexico, Calexico. And on the Mexican side is Mexi Cali, <laughs> Mexico, California. And so uh, we're a little over a hundred years old in that region, thanks to the Colorado River from which 28 to 30 million people uh, are able to make a uh, life in the desert in that region. And um, it, the, I think that experience, that that border area is, of course, of course, heavily Mexican and the, 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 the traditional people, their original uh, folks there are the Cucapá, tribes in that region and and precisely where my grandfather's uh, farm was we were right at the edge of a volcano called uh, Cerro Prieto on the Mexican side of the border and uh, that's uh, very much a sacred space there uh, he was my great-grandfather there was a healer that uh, you know he'd be he'd be caring for the cows at one second someone would come in with a broken leg and he would fix it or with some kind of medical problem and he would he would fix people and um and so but there you have a large large chinese population you have a large indian population you have a turkish population uh among from apart from the original folks and then the mexican ladino and of course the anglo-saxons that came later and stole half of mexico from us in 1848 right but but you have a tremendous blend of uh, of folks there. I think the, maybe the more famous uh, original folks from that area are the Yaqui, Apache, you know, folks. And so um, even though in my town we're like heavy, heavy Mexican, you know, very, very parochial in that sense, but we were, there, there was a, a, a multifaceted sense. One, because of the border, and also because Mexicali is actually the capital city of Baja California Norte. And so it was like a million people versus our little town, which was like 12,000. Like we were like basically a neighborhood of the powerful Mexican town and across the border with two TV stations, like seven radio stations and a whole a whole life that's created when you have so, so many people knowing. And so that that for me created a sense of always searching for that diversity and the the commonalities between differences and uh, and also all the drama of being in a little town and and all and being in tight-knit families where there's always fighting right <laughs> and all that fighting i think uh led me to really search out what we call now today nonviolent communication no uh the the form of of listening being interactive and understanding what another person is saying before you actually speak but looking for the common ground looking for healing looking for that for that commonality and, and where are we together and i think the other thing that my growing up established in me was a very deep deep uh, appreciation and gratefulness for for the working class for being working class and uh, i remember just uh, thinking all the stories of my parents' uh, struggles and, and, and uh, the reality of just, we lived um, not, not, the, not necessarily just the harshness, but all of it. Just thinking, wow, the working class, we are the strongest, strongest people in the world. You know, as a kid, I never used the word working class. You know, it was like, we're the workers. Well, we're the working people. We're, we know how to do everything. We bake everything from anything <laughs> we invent, we create. And so, but also the other thing as a child was that we were one of, you know, in the towns, there's always like a kiosk in the middle of the plaza and, and there's always a family or some kids playing the, playing, uh, you know, in the community. And, and that was, we were one of those families that <laughs> we had, we were always playing in the cultural events and, and that culture also, I, I really strongly remember, I must have, I don't know how old I was, but I was uh, between seven and nine, something like that. And I was playing the guitar with my sisters and brothers who were singing in this community event. And this 
older ladies started crying with uh, when I was playing. I thought, wow, I have power, you know. Wow, I have power to, it was one of my first experiences of power um, to, that we, that is goes much more than money, you know, and, and in organizing, we say, you know, the rich have money and the organized, the community has people. And that was one of those experiences of, of the kind of spiritual power that you have in, in integrity and in producing good work, you know. Uh, there I was a little kid playing the lead guitar for our our music and uh and they really taught me a lot of that of, of power in, in a good way yeah and I like how you said spiritual power yes very much so That's so key. so then back to your question about um so that uh, as an adult then I started working and uh, through going to Logan Heights in San Diego and uh, and um, I learned about Archbishop Romero in El Salvador, who was murdered by the United States through, of course, through their army. You know, the U.S. will say we didn't do it, but yeah, the United States basically murdered Archbishop Romero, and uh, and that led me to go through Jesuit refugee services um, to work in Central America and El Salvador. I, I I became a Jesuit a seminarian, studying to be a priest, and I was there four years. And, after, and in that process, we started refugee houses here in, in Los Angeles, in, in Oakland, in San Jose, in San Francisco, part of the, part of the sanctuary movement. That, that we took the model from the Underground Railroad of the African-American liberation struggles you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, in the 80s and, and created that kind of Underground Railroad scenario. But in the work uh, in Central America, which was in Panama, El Salvador, Guatemala, and then of course in Mexico as well, um, those were, I think for, for me, those revolutionary struggles were really my formation in political analysis, in mental health work as well, because I was always approaching it from the faith perspective, because that's been, you know, um, where I'd be coming from all my life. I mean, my first marches were really pilgrimages with Our Lady of Guadalupe, Don Ansin, you know. <laughs> Those were the, uh, my first marches were, were spiritual pilgrimages. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and so, but in Central America, in particular El Salvador, uh, it was wonderful to see the combination of intellectual, and working class and uh, a, a culture, spirituality, all those things coming together in a deep way. Um, thanks to God we had in the 60s what they called the Vatican II Council within the Catholic Church and it really opened the doors to saying, what is faith if you're not serving your sister, brother, your siblings, your other, right? And in the Nahuatl, we have that phrase, en la etch, which means, tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. So, yeah, so, and so that really, the experience in El Salvador really taught me a lot and working particularly with the revolutionary movements there in terms of, uh, um, it, my work was all in the area of mental health, in the area of working in the refugee camps, supporting. And I was there, I went very particularly there because it was like, look, I pay taxes, I'm a US citizen, my tax dollars are wreaking horror, mm -hmm. hell, war in all these places. And what's my responsibility as a person of faith? What is my responsibility as a taxpayer? I'm paying just like right now we're paying for this horrible genocide in, in in Palestine we're paying for the horrific crimes going on in Haiti we're paying for 30 people per day being murdered in Mexico for this drug war that Nixon invented which is still the strategy of divide and conquer that US is using right uh, in the Congo and the Sudan so many wars and so many violent uh, military bases that we're funding 60 cents of every dollar you and I pay Amina and our listeners goes to war. You know, it's like, 
you can say all you want about democracy, spirituality, prayer, or whatever you believe. Mm -hmm. You and I are paying for murder and genocide. And so the same was true in the 80s. And so that's why I went to El Salvador to say, I can be a witness. Mm -hmm. I can let people know in the United States what we're paying for and people will will uh, stop. And we had very much successes. One success nobody ever unders talks about is that the United States military and the elites um, classes were ready to invade Nicaragua in the very first second that the Sandinista revolution won. But it was it was the people power that stopped them from doing that. And since it didn't happen, right? I mean, they, they murdered millions of people um, and in the war against Sandinistas uh, through Honduras, they murdered thousands, thousands of people. But, but the big invasion that they were to do didn't happen. Um, just like the nuclear bombing of Vietnam didn't happen uh, because of the peace movement in, in that era, you know, that stopped Nixon from really committing um, those unspeakable crimes. But, um, and so uh, the the learning from Central America is for me and and Mexico and, and really here later in community organizing was, you know, people power. How do we nourish solidarity? How do we nourish uh, us believing in ourselves? There's a wonderful song in the Salvadorian popular mass. Uh, uh, it says, Cuando el pobre crea en el pobre, ya podremos cantar libertad. When the poor believe in the poor, then we can sing freedom. No, so we waste too much time believing in the in in the false ideas. And now you even got pop singers saying, "I want to be a billionaire," and a bunch of other illusions that are really opium. You know, it's like, um, and so it, it's about the poor believing in the poor. It's about. Yeah, yeah, I love that quote. All these quotes you're sharing, Francisco, I want it to be written down and <laughs> I want to say it in, in, in Spanish. I'm learning Spanish. I need to, so and, and say it better. I love those quotes. You know, you mentioned a bit about the, the different forms of violence that you see in Central America, right? And the suffering. How has that changed? Maybe even the way you're looking at the, the, the issues going on here in, in our community, right? And specifically Fruitvale. So, you know, yeah, how, how are you making those connections and what are they? Yeah, I think I want to start that question with a big shout out to the Latino Task Force, of which I've been a, <laughs> a, a participant during the last few years that uh, we as community launched in, in, the, in the mission in San Francisco during COVID. Uh, and I'm, I'll tell you why I do want to do the, the shout out to Latino Task Force. Um, to your question, it's very interesting because uh, what's happening in our inner cities, I've seen it in LA and other places, but I particularly I've been seeing it in Oakland as we get started with this campaign called the Fruitvale Peace Initiative, and and the which which has been supported very much by love over fear, right? Which we're talking about now. In, in the war, in particularly in Salvador, there, there's one psychologist who was murdered in, in the university, his name Ignacio Martin Baró, and he, he coined a phrase which, for me, I don't know if he started, but for me is the word I first heard it from him, was uh, generalized psychosis. And and it's I see it in Oakland, as I used to see it in the war in Salvador, in Guatemala. You basically, you basically lose a sense of the the reg just the basic rules of of the community you know you don't stop at a red light because you're gonna you could get killed in any moment a bomb could go off you 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 know you you move in a way where the rules don't really matter and i see that right now in oakland uh mm -hmm. is you know people just throwing trash anywhere no no respecting any of the signals uh yeah, I've seen people wearing pajamas at the bank, you know, like, and they, it's like it, there's a sense where things don't have shifted to a place where it doesn't really matter, you know, mm -hmm. and and I keep hearing this from young people. Well, if the rich can do it, if the rich can rip off, if the politicians can be corrupt, so can I, you know. Um, in fact, you have 
you have kids selling drugs who are being sponsored by police, right? And so, so, so the, the, when there's corruption and destruction at the periphery, it's because there's corruption and destruction at the core. And so when people see, well, you know, the rich can do whatever the hell they want. Trump's not even in jail. Look, at he should be in prison. That means it doesn't really matter, right? So there's this attitude of it doesn't really matter because it doesn't matter for the rich, it doesn't matter for us. And so, and, and so an attitude of that be, becomes generalized. So that's what generalized psychosis means, no? Uh, and how you, and how you work with that is, and that's why I wanted to meet, mention the Latino Task Force, but a quote we say there a lot, community led, community driven, community implemented, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I get emotional because we went, we've gone through a lot as a community and in this period of, of COVID and all that stuff. And so love over fear uh, and the peace, uh, Fruitvale Peace Initiative and the work that so many organizations are doing, Courage, the CRC folks, La Clinica de la Raza with Cultura Bienestar program, uh, the merchants over at the Obelisco restaurant at the Fruitvale Plaza, Wapapa Kitchen, uh, you know, the folks the, at Unity Council, whether it's the housing or the schools, the, the Arise High School, uh, all the folks are doing, are trying to do something, you know. And I learned a very big lesson uh, back in the 90s in the Mission District. It was very interesting. Back then, you had in the Mission 15,000 kids, and you had, out of the 15,000, you had 600 who were gang members, and you had 75 who were armed, mm -hmm. right? Well, just one of those with a gun causes havoc. I mean, my friend Gloria got shot right there, uh, right in the corner of 24th and Folsom, right? Mm -hmm. So just one can cause havoc. Uh, but what, what we for, failed to focus on is that there's 14,400 students, kids who are students, who are working, who are sending money to their families if they're in another country, who are getting trained to do something, who, you know, who are focused and are, there's 14,400, right? <laughs> and and uh, that's a great majority. And that's the same thing that happens with the working class, no? And so uh, that we're a large majority, but in front of the, in front of the thug, in front of the bank, in front of the, in front of the big investor, we feel alone, just like a kid in the bus with six gang members feels alone. He's not thinking, oh, I'm 14,400 strong. No, so I'm alone in front of six gang members and one has a knife or one has a gun, right? So this is what for me uh, it, it become, has become real. It's like the disinvestment, the intention of the corporation and, and uh, and in the corporation, politicians become managers for corporations, right? The intention of the corporation right now is to basically make one state from white flight where you get all the money from Cupertino to Oakland and basically cut off that region. And if you don't live with, if you don't make $250,000 a year, you don't fit here. You could be in a bank, you can live somewhere else and come and work, you can come and shine shoes, you can come and be the grocery guy, you can come and be the teacher, you can come be the accountant, but you're not gonna live here unless you make $250,000 a year. So that's the corporation goal, to, to create a kind of Hunger Games scenario, right? Where you have one, one gated community and, and all the workers come in and do, and do the work there, but they don't get to live there. So that's what's happening in the Fruitvale. That's what's happening in San Francisco's mission and other districts, Bayview. That's what's happening in the big cities in LA, in the, the LA city. That's what's happening in all over with so, the so-called gentrification. It's like, we're gonna kick you guys out and we're gonna take over this place. But to do that, we have to create blight. We have to make sure that there's violence. Uh, so if, if, like two, two weeks ago, there was a three hour robbery in the middle of the night in the, where the bakery and the little computer shop is at the Fruitvale Bar Plaza. And the, no one showed up, no cops showed up, no one showed up for three hours. So there's this kind of a boycott happening by police departments and other uh, political act, actors, you know, saying, let's let these communities go to rot so the prices go down and so people get desperate and leave 
And uh, just like they did with the Western edition in the 70s in San Francisco, no? And, and do different strategies to kick people out and we can take over. So to, how, do we, how do we combat that kind of violence, no? And we do it by creating, you know, efforts that are people-led, people-driven, and people implemented and um and that's where i think love over fear comes in right right and part of our love over fear oakland campaign is talking about investment right where or how can the city invest in these you said people-led community-led solutions yeah, exactly. So one of the beautiful things, uh, and props to San Francisco Foundation for supporting through the BACC the the these efforts in which you and I and and B Dukes are involved, in seeing be getting beauty to come out right. So um, I think that that we as human beings love beauty, right? Uh, and uh, and one. Of of the things that we can do through that creation of beauty so for example in in our case uh you're doing these wonderful podcasts that are helping us see ourselves as community members and what we're doing b b is doing whole series of photography uh uh photo photographic essays really of, of who of people involved in creating life and peace and I'll be uh, with with Caminante Cultural Foundation. Uh, we were going to be producing three and or more concerts in the Fruit Belt Plaza, and with the Peace Fruit Belt Peace Initiative, the idea is to get people at the Fruit Belt Plaza, so that we can build on that beauty, build on that community, build on those fourteen thousand four hundred. No, <laughs> as wow. the uh, 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 that we are and create that sense, just like you do it, see it in Latin America and Asia and Africa and other, the marketplace, right? Where it's all these community folks coming together, sharing time, telling the gossip, share, uh, you know, learning from each other, all, the, all, that, all that wonderful life experience. And I'll tell you, a, a, my new school example, when the Vietnamese started showing to San Francisco and they started going to, they started living in the, in the tenderloin, and I hear from several people about that little period, how all of a sudden when people who were predatory behavior and no stuff, they started seeing like moms with little baby carriages. It really impacted them. And they started staying away from those areas <laughs> because they said, or at least being respectful, said, oh, there's children here, there's moms here, there's grandmas here, there's aunties here. You know, that, so creating that space uh, with your presence, no? Um, it, it, and so I think that's one piece, the presence. But in terms of engaging the society and this, engaging the community, we're also going to be doing the questions to City Hall for people. What does safety look like for you, right? What does beauty look like for you? What does love look like for you? And those questions are addressed in what APT, uh, APTP, uh, anti-police, Ter terrorist project as them has put in 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 as as priorities and right now april may and june city hall in oakland is looking precisely at the at the mid budget cycle right and so what what are we going to propose for the budget for next year right now that we're in the middle of the section of the cycle right and so this is a perfect moment for people to write your city council person or the president of the city council nikki boss fortunato you know and say i want to see safety in in how we create better programs, how we create job opportunities, how we create space where people can have real responses to their needs um, in, in creative ways. You know, you have 400 kids there in the Fruit Belt, just to give an example, 400 kids there at the Arise School mm -hmm. who could be doing tremendous stuff right there in the plaza every afternoon from three to six, you know, with after school programs that programs that you and I benefited, benefited from. That's why we're artists, right? That's why we're cultural workers because of these community programs. I, I My daughter Alma is a film editor. She did edited one film with her mentor, um, uh, Jason Pollard. Uh, it's called, uh, 
Black and Blues. Um, ay, ¿Cómo se llama? Anyway, I'll remember. When I'm not thinking about it, I'll remember the film. But anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, Satchmo is saying how he became uh, an artist because of the after school programs, you know, because of the, the street programs where they were teaching them school. And uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, Black and Blues is the film called, they're on t Apple TV. But, and, and that's, I focus on that because I, it just really sparked me that in, in those years, whatever it was, he's a little kid on the street and it was the music program that really engaged him, you know? And so, we, uh, uh, homie over in Los Angeles says, nothing stops a bullet like a job, right? Nothing stops a bullet like a job. Nothing creates peace, but peace, peaceful action, you know, peaceful programs, programs where you're learning from each other, whether it's painting or gardening or any of that stuff, but getting people in, into action. And that's what dissipates fear. That's what dissipates psychosis. Um, and that's what corporations really don't want to see because, you know, they want us to be focusing on wanting to be rich instead of focusing on living right here, right now with what we have, you know. And um, I think for me, one of the lessons of the revolutions that I've participated in uh, as a, has, has been, I keep thinking, my friend, um, my friend, Martin was kicked out of what, well, he fled Guatemala. He was going to be murdered because he was in a group trying to figure out how to make public bathrooms in their community. Public bathrooms, you know, <laughs> in their community. And so, uh, he, he, you know, there's all these things that the revolutionary processes fought for that we already, some of that we already have here. You know, I was sitting over at the social service office the other day um and uh, and just looking at some of those services that are there and thinking wow you know people other countries have died just trying to get this going so there's like a little platform on which we can build right my friend died in the hospital general hospital the other day in in, in san francisco and and he yeah you should have seen the treatment there it was really good treatment i mean and yet no money you know, and I'm thinking, yes, that's what socialism looks like. You know, uh, you have no money, but you have you're treated with respect and the best treatment. Um, and so if it's, it's amazing about the mixed economies and this mixed struggles, mixed things that we live here. What I'm trying to say is there's uh, successes that are folks on whose shoulders we stand have earned. And we and we benefit from those, yeah. My father was a kid when there were still signs in the restaurants that said we reserve the right to refuse service to dogs, blacks, and Mexicans. And and I mean, you still have Trump trying to say that stuff. And of course, MAGA is really code for make America slave again. So you still have the forces of some elites that are a minority really trying to bring us back to slavery, hatred, violence, and destruction. And they're doing a good job in Palestine right now because we're paying for it, right? But but you have successes on which we can build uh, and really um, continue. We, we're not in the utopian, of course not, right? But there's, there's things here that exist that we can build on. And I, I think that that's a really important piece uh, to work on. There is deep violence in our communities, but there's tremendous love and effort that many, many of the communities are putting together. And of one final example, back to the Latino Task Force. You know, we got together in, in, there in the mission. We said, here we are. We did a, a in April of 2020, uh, a bunch of us got together with day laborers, domestic workers, all the communities from all over the place uh, and pulled together a study with UCSF of over 4,600 tests were taken in that weekend of April 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th, which is exactly four years ago next week. <laughs> um, and it was historical. But from there, we opened the doors and there was a about 8,200 people on the streets were able to find a hotel room. 
for free because we forced the city to do that. You know, there was an undocu fund that was created where people were able to get cash assistance. There was a food hub that was created that has served tens and twenties of thousands of people, not just in San Francisco, but Oakland, San Jose, Watsonville, all the way to Delano, California. People coming together, right? You either have cash or you have people. We have people. And that's, that's what we need to really work on. But it only works if you believe in one another. If you believe it, if you're off in, with, the, with, the drug, with the drug idea that you're going to be um, filthy rich one day, it doesn't work because you're not going to focus on your community. You're going to focus on, oh, someday I'm going to be rich. Who gives a shit about that, you know? And that's the most theological work I, word I can think about. Who gives a shit about that? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, no, 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 no. Believe in your people. Believe in yourself. Yes, we have a bunch of problemas. Yes, we have a bunch of violence, internal violence. Let's work on it, you know? Uh, right now, I'm living in a community called the Canticle Farm, which is right here on 36 and, and Fruit foothill right and there's what we have coming on the cultural foundation we work in san francisco oakland la many different places with the caminante but we're it, it, through this community the canticle we've got folks working with re-entry and the and the jails we got folks working on education we got folks working on climate change we got folks working on rematriation the sugority land trust is there that has just worked for 25 years and finally was able to get back the shell mound in, in the territory right now known as Berkeley, right? But um, it happened, those kind of changes happen when people believe in one another. And I think that's, that's the, the key ingredient to this thing is start believing in the working class again. Start believing in yourselves. Start believing in ourselves and luck. Etch. Tu eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. I love that. I just love that quote so much. Oh, thank you, Francisco. And thank you for reminding us. We stand on the foundation that others in our history have cultivated and we can learn so much from that. But there is a foundation that we do stand on. There's an opportunity of really believing in the people. And I think it reminds me of like the rich like culture and diversity of Oakland. You know, my favorite memory is is getting the best tacos from the local f food trucks, the street vendors, you know, in Fruitvale. And then I can go to uh, um, Little Saigon and get the best pho there, you know? And it's just like, I'm able to go to these different places and interact and build relationships in these different communities. And thank you for reminding us that there's power in that when we come together, you know? So, um, yes, I love, love um, that is a real, that's a real beauty about Oakland. I'm sorry I interrupted oh, no. you. you. No, 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 yes. No, no, no. I, I, I love the one thing I totally love about Oakland is everywhere that I go to a event or a party or a gathering, it's always such a mix, you know, and, uh, and it's really beautiful. Where folks are working, you know, uh, people that make this criticism, uh, uh, and we and rightly so about capitalism, as, as but the the I think the miss is that we're saying the U.S. is a capitalist nation, and the in reality, all those income tax, public schools, public parks, uh, all you know, public library, all these things are from a socialist experience are from socialist practices you know capitalism doesn't want any of that crap they want private they only want private for those who can pay you know you want to see capitalism go to mexico we had to raise twelve thousand dollars for my father-in-law to not die at the hospital door because if he didn't have twelve thousand dollars to get in so we called everyone ever got in debt and for everything so we could have the money to get him into the hospital because he had a, he had a serious life-threatening issue uh, here, you know, you go to general and it's right there. Why? Because enough of us have believed in social good, in the common good, in socialist practices. And, and we've put them into practices. It's not uh, the whole thing, right? But, but there's, 
that comes in from that variety, from that diversity, because people have different ideas and different experiences and are able to bring them together. Politically speaking right now, for example, no ethnic group could really win, uh, their, their, uh, get a ca candidate into place just by their ethnic group. No, we, we have to combine. And that's where we move beyond ethnic chauvinism and all that other crap. We go, go into, uh, this diversity which are which is already there which is already there you know and build with what is already there and uh and oakland is a wonderful place of diversity with people that really believe in each other and can work with each other you know uh there was a in the 90s there was this thing about uh well the kids of immigrants and and the black and brown and the asian how will they get along well the kids were getting along the kids were getting along and the kids are getting along you know it's uh it's really the on the one hand and the adult level but it's really capital the real problem here is capital because uh again maga or is maga is really code for make america slave again and and what since the 1930s when the communist movement was so strong in the United States, the Socialist Party was so strong, the anarchist movement was very powerful uh, in the 20s and 30s. Since those days, capital has been thinking, how the heck are we gonna divide the working class? How do we divide this power? How do we make them not believe in each other and destroy themselves, you know? Uh, that's why the police many times will take uh, someone from the blue gang and put him in the middle of a red, red gang zone and that kind of thing which, you know, it, how capital's goal has been to divide and conquer the working class and suck our blood. And so how, how do we build on our diversity to support each other to really build working class power? That's, that's the, for me, one of the most spiritual uh, practices you can do is find the common good and work with each other uh, to build the common good <laughs> and healthy right now to build health to build uh, thriving communities yeah. absolutely i you know i remember growing up you know through my trials right and you spoke a little bit about mental health i was able to i guess you know maintain my well-being because of my diverse friendships of, of my friends from different uh you know ethnicity i I learned about their cultural practices. I learned going to their home and having food and you know what I mean, cooking together, learning about this. Whatever was going on in my home, you know, whatever challenges I was going through, these relationships and just so blessed to be, you know, growing up in the environment of Oakland, that maintained my mental, my overall well being. So there's definitely power um, in people and in, in moments between just coming together. Um, we we're talking about people power. You have a wonderful concert. You know, you said that art is not for you entertainment. It's a, it's a tool for transformation, right? And so you're using your healing art of being, you know, a, a singer, songwriter. Tell us about these community concerts, um, which we have on 28th, I believe. Can you give us detailed information, how people can come and, you know, see you and, and, and contribute and support? Um, yeah, um, you reminded me though, Amina, right now, when you said about your childhood, I remember I used to go across the border to the Mexico site with my, my friend, Danny Wong, and used to go to Chinese school with him. <laughs> oh, that's a, in seventh grade, I learned to write my name in Chinese, but anyway. Yes. Yes, so, um, so, with the merchants uh, through Love Over Fear campaign, with Caminante Cultural Foundation, with restorative media, all shout shout out to uh, Troy Williams, one of our heroes. Um, uh, the merchants right in the Fruit Belt Plaza. We're putting together a series of concerts. One will be Saturday the 27th from 12 to 4. And then Love Over Fear concert will be Sunday, April 28th. So both Saturday and Sunday, we'll be having concerts there um, uh, from 12, 12 to three kind of thing. 
Uh, in this first concert, I'll be performing uh, music from my album Honor Migrante, Migrant Pride, and uh, and other albums. So I'll be there. Uh, we'll have um, Chris Trinidad on bass. We'll have a per percussions, and also we're gonna have Inti Mística, which they do more Andean and also cumbias, and we'll have a uh, uh, DJ, and that'll be the twenty eighth in the Fruitvale Plaza. So people can just take the BART, get off, and uh, just go right into having a good time and supporting, really creating a space where families can move. At the concert, we're also going to have cards with, with uh, language that people can say no, send notes to City Hall in Oakland in, uh, pushing for the kind of programming that they should be investing to to uh, dissipate violence, dissipate violence and create safety, uh, community led, community implemented safety, you know, uh, and there's so many programs that are doing tremendous work. You, you've mentioned them. So that'll be in, in that's uh, April and May. Um, I think it's been May 19th. We're still working on the date for May and we're working on a date for June and July as well. And I know I've talked with Kev Choice, so Hopefully one of those, uh, maybe June or July, he'll be able to join us there. Um, and, and the choice. That's right. The choice. Kev choice. <laughs> the choice. <laughs> uh, and uh, and so, so that'll be April 28th that we'll be there and we would love everyone to join us in two, in two weeks, basically two Sundays from now um, to join us. And also if you can come Saturday at 27th, that'll be another group of musics and other groups of music that will be, be presenting there. For you guys, follow Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, this IG Live, to, you know, get updated, get all the detailed information that you need to support these events. If anyone have questions for Francisco, this is the time to put it in the comment section. Um, thank you so much, Francisco. I mean, this was, this was beautiful. Just it's always a beautiful moment building with you. You put so much, um, I, you know, your, your, the beauty that you speak about, it, it is unraveled while you and I are, are building on this. And I'm gonna ask you what I've always asked every one of the guests that, you know, at this very moment, if we did a public presentation and we're gonna lift the veil off of love, we lift the veil off of love, what, would love look like right this very moment? Uh, for me, it's community sharing all the wealth that we create every day and all the uh, the healing, working issues out together uh, as families, as communities, and really uh, building, building together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Francisco. It's an honor to 